Please be seated. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father, to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Just last week, somebody said something to me about we Lutherans don't spend enough time and energy on the last days. And yet here we are. All of the lessons, Daniel, Hebrews, and the Gospel that you heard read, all deal with the last days. Now it might have something to do with these are one of the last Sundays in Pentecost, which I think we can count on. But it also has to do with the reality that the last days are something we do need to focus on from time to time. And part of our difficulty is best illustrated by a story that I once heard about a golfer who was visited by an angel. And the angel appeared and the golfer said, I'm glad to see you because I've had a question that I've lived with for years. Are there golf courses in heaven? <laughs> and the angel said, well, I have good news and I have bad news. The good news is, yes, we have a plethora of golf courses. The bad news is you're signed up for a tea time at 9 o'clock tomorrow morning. <laughs> <laughs> ah, now we're starting to get into the reality of why we don't deal with those last days. Because they make for a great joke about golf. But we're not confronted with <coughs> three and a half ton stones stacked up on each other, making a wall of over 150 feet high, pillars that are 145 feet high, doors made of brass and bronze and coated in gold. We don't have buildings like that, do we? That take over three quarters of an acre. And yet that's what the disciples looked at with Jesus when they're talking about the temple. If you go to Israel today and you look at the ruins, you have a hard time imagining how did they break this wall down with these stones as huge as they are. Forget the Romans were great engineers. And so in the uprising of 70, they made it their point to destroy it. Was that the last day? I don't know. Doesn't seem like it. Daniel is writing to a people who are in exile. And he is, he is giving them a prophecy that there is going to be an end to what they are experiencing. He's not giving them a whole lot of detail about it. There's no timeline, no timetable. He's not giving any great, accurate description. He is just saying there will be an end. Now, why in the world would somebody say there's going to be an end of days and you should feel good about that? Because if we truly believe that God is the one that brings those last days into being, we have hope for what those last days are going to be. Hebrews. The Hebrews reading talks about this new covenant and this new priesthood that has begun in Christ. And they are writing to a people who are in a great persecution. And they are saying in Hebrews, there's going to be an end. And the end will be the kingdom of God. Should that be scary? Or should that be hopeful? For those that are under persecution, it's hopeful. For those who are truly believers and, and suffering the consequences of that faith, they are looking at it as something to look forward to. And as I said, the disciples, they've got their thing going too. The magnificence of the world in which they live, and Jesus says, don't depend on that. It's all going to be torn down. But Jesus also says that once it's torn down, God's presence will still be available. A young man who had brought home a terrible report card in high school defended his report card with his father by saying, well, Dad, you know, I mean, in church they were talking about the last days are upon us, so what difference does it make? <laughs> And the father, in his ultimate wisdom, looked at his son and he said, what makes you think that over all these thousands of years and the billions of people that have been waiting for the last day, what makes you think you're going 
get to see it. <laughs> After a moment's pause, and the son not having a smart answer, the father said, if I was you, I would be working on a plan B. We are living in the plan B. But we've got to take the first thing for granted. We have to realize that this is a reality in which we live. The lessons of the lessons are that God has the last word on life and death. That's what Daniel is telling the people of Israel. If God says life, it's life. And it doesn't matter what the rest of the world says. It doesn't matter that you may be exiled. It doesn't matter that you are being persecuted. It does, that does not matter because the end of things is God has the final word. And Daniel says, you can believe that. Hebrews. Hebrews, in a time when it is costly. Costly. In the wallet. In life. In family. To say, I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. The letter, the letter of Hebrews is telling the people, the Jews of the day, be strong in your knowledge of the fact that God is still God. The last days will be an end. I love the imagery in, uh, in Hebrews because it speaks to a sense of perseverance. Faith, we, we sometimes think, I believe, and now everything's going to be okay. Doesn't work that way. In fact, sometimes saying, I believe, just makes life harder. I know it is in my house. It makes it harder because we have to understand and deal with the differences in which we live and exist. People that have been a part of my life for 50 and more years, we have very, very different opinions of what's going on in our world today. But there's one thing that we still share. We know there will be an end. And at the end, we will be together. In the course of my years in ministry, I have been with widows, who have said to me, my husband's died, my life is over. And at first they were not very happy with me because I looked at them and smiled and I said, bet me. And they found out I wasn't going to let their life be over. I wasn't going to let them hole up in their home. I wasn't going to let them be overwhelmed by their grief. And it wasn't me alone, but it was all their brothers and sisters in faith that shared with them in that fellowship of faith. I remember a gentleman who was a, a banker. He'd been a bank manager for many, many years and he lost his job and he told me my life was over. I said, oh no, it isn't over. Our treasurer resigned two weeks ago. You got a job. <laughs> he found out I wasn't kidding. I had a son come home and say, I, I, I failed algebra again, Dad. My life is over. I won't be able to go to college. I said, think again. <laughs> These lessons today are telling us that when we see the natural disasters and we see political unrest and we see wars and we live through losses, <coughs> don't ever say it's over. Because God is the only one that has the word to say it's over. And when he says it's over, he's saying it is over in an unbelievable way. Because it means his kingdom is then amongst us. The last days for us. I love the terms in Hebrews about birth pangs. It's interesting. Women always share with their husbands what giving birth is like and how terrible it is. And, you know, and, and if you watch TV, you see, uh, you know, comedies or movies or whatever, and women say terrible things to their husbands during during childbirth. You know, you lose the eyes. He's screaming.
screaming and yelling and everything. Well, I got news for you. I know women that have had kidney stones and they told me it's worse. And I believe them because I've had kidney stones. We have something in common. But there was life on the end of the kidney stones, just like there was life after birth. You got children. The pain is gone. There's a new, fresh sense of life and living. The pain which we go through, and it is pain, because it's not easy to say, ah, I wish it wasn't like this. To wake up in the morning and say, I'd rather lay in bed and sleep through this and hope it's all a dream. Yeah, that'd be great. And we do have things we have to go through, but there is something on the end, and that's what the last days are about, is there is an end. Do we meet the challenges of the world that we face with hope because we know that end that is promised is real? I think Lutherans don't talk a whole lot about the last days because the last days for us are like the carrot on the end of the stick. It's what we're all waiting for. And if we really believe what we say when we pray the Lord's Prayer, your kingdom come, your will be done, and we mean it, we're looking forward to it. <coughs> now the road there may not be as easy as we would like it to be, but that kingdom that we look for is will being done something positive. Are we able to know that there will be an end of time, that temples will fall, and yet trust in God's promise? There once was a gentleman who was having lunch on one of those outdoor decks, you know, out eating lunch. And a duck came in and walked over to him and said, hey, you got any grapes? And the man looked at him and said, I'm eating lunch. No, I don't have any grapes. Go away. So the duck walked away a little bit. He turned around and came back and he said, Hey, bud, you got any grapes? And the guy said, No, I still don't have any grapes. The duck walked away a little bit and came back. He said, Hey, you have any grapes? And the guy said, Look, if you don't walk away, I'm going to take a nail and I'm going to nail your feet to this deck. And the duck walked, started to walk away and came back and he said, You have any nails? <laughs> And the man said, no. He said, oh, then do you have any grapes? <laughs> no matter how many times we ask, God, is your promise real? He's going to say yes. And if we ask if it's an empty promise, God's going to say, what do you think? Because what we think and what we believe is the evidence of his promise. Faith is acting on a promise that is unreal as if it is real. That we see biblically over and over and over again in the story of God and His people. We can see it in our own lives when we have dared to believe, even when everybody said, You're crazy, we got rewarded. Not by things being easy, but by living out that promise. It doesn't mean everything's going to be easy and everything's going to be nice because we believe, but if we continue to believe the promise is real and we act on it, we become a different people than the rest of the people in the world in which we live. And once we become that, we become what the Hebrew word for holy is. We become weird. We're the strange ones in this world. Because we believe in God's promise, we act on it as if it is true, and therefore we are different. All because we know there's a last day coming. We're not scared of it. In fact, we look forward to it. Because we know that at that point, the fulfillment of the promise made by God in Christ is complete. Y'all got any grapes? <laughs> Amen.